Um, the final round is now beginning, so could I please ask everyone to please take a seat. Okay. No contestant should be in the room at this time except the first speaker. Once the round has begun, no one will be allowed to leave the room until the final speaker has finished. If you feel you may need to leave before the round is done, please consider slipping out before we begin. There are to be no photographs, tape recordings, or videos taken during the speeches. Please turn off any phones, beepers, pagers, and watch alarms now. There's to be no texting the entire round. Thank you. I'm an extremely competitive kid, and unfortunately, I also have two extremely competitive brothers. And so we always try to compete with games, athletics activities, and always try to outdo one another, because it's always game on in our household. But when I think of this phrase, game on, and the competition that's automatically associated with it, I have to say, ultimately, at the end of the day, it reveals the best in all of us. Sometimes taking on that mindset of game on really brings out the best in us because we're really committed to things after that point. And so today, let's examine a few examples of when taking on this mindset, this mindset of really focusing down on the game, was beneficial not only to the individual, but sometimes maybe even the society and arguably the world. So first, Zhu Liang. Now, I currently am studying Chinese history, and this man, Zhu Liang, is one of the greatest Chinese military tacticians ever to have lived. But he was around during the warring states period of China, when there were many equally genius and talented military tacticians. And so part of his success was constantly defining and deriving this competition from his other foes. It was always game on for him. And his best strategies only came to light when this competition was actually in space. So an example I particularly think of is when he was greatly outnumbered in the thicket of fog. It was during the night and the visibility was pretty bad. You couldn't really see any forces. But he knew he had less men. But it was still game on. This is one of the most critical moments of his entire military career. But he has to make this decision, has to succeed. So what does he do? He does something, well, particularly shortly. He decides to tie four torches to each of his men and send them out through the fog. So to the enemy, it looks as though he has four times the numbers. It was game on. The competition was really heavy at that time, and he really had to pull through. And it was that pressure that made him come up with this genius tactic, make it look like you had four times the troops that you actually had. And so we see that sometimes genius military ideas, or even great thoughts in general, are the result of this game on mindset when we try to face the competition before us. But looking at another example, let's come to my own personal life. Now, yesterday my coach was taking me around Manila and went to Cold Stones. And what I didn't realize was here in Cold Stones, they do something very different from everywhere else. You can actually catch the ice cream like in your mouth. Never heard of this before. It was really, really cool. But I was with my housing buddy, you know, and the host was showing us around and he said, okay, you know, 
people don't always catch the ice cream, so we're going to see which one you can do it better. And immediately he starts recording this. I get my little cup, I'm standing far back, and immediately the young person tosses the ice cream into the air. My friend is the first one to get it. catches it perfectly, solid. And I look at him like, dang. <laughs> you, know, you, you don't look very athletic when you pull that one off. <laughs> <laughs> no ice cream in my hand. He was smaller, more Asian, and wimpier than me. <laughs> and so, after that moment, I put my game face on. I got my cup ready. I saw ice cream go through the air, <laughs> hit my shoulder, smeared my dress shirt. That's because I'm not wearing my lucky white dress shirt today. And, you know, after that moment, things went kind of badly. And so, even though it didn't turn out to be a total success, I have to say, the mindset still helped. I mean, who knows how terribly I would have done if I hadn't seen your mind before. What if I was the person who catch it? Gosh, look why I hit my face. All over me right now. But that wasn't the case. Because you know, there was that competitive element to it. It was game on for me. And for that reason, I attribute my semi successful ventures in ice cream catching to that competition. But finally, let's come to one of my favorite books that shows us how sometimes when we're in a position of absolute desperation, we sometimes put on that game base to succeed in the future. The Count of Monte Cristo essentially surrounds the story of a young man named Edmund Octaves. He was a sailor, and you know, being a sailor is confronted by the sea, but also a sea of troubles. See, his good friends, who at least he thinks are his friends, put him into a position where they betray him, put him into prison, and his entire future career seems to be ruined. And he was totally naive to all this that was happening around him prior to that moment. But then, when he finds himself in prison, he realizes he needs to change his attitude. It's time to put his game face on. He was naive to everything that was happening around him, totally oblivious. But now he's going to make that change. He decides to become a better man, comes back out of prison, escapes, becomes an extremely wealthy and powerful ruler of a small island called Monte Cristo, and is eventually able to exact revenge on those that ultimately betrayed him in the first place. So we see that sometimes out of situations of desperation, that's when the game base is put on, and that's how we succeed. So be it the situation of desperation for a military tactician, me in trying to catch that ice cream as it was flying through the air, or even for the Count of Monte Cristo. I believe that sometimes we need to put our game bases on to, well, win the game. Thank you.
had an open mic here. And I was going to be myself. And I decided to just stay in the corner watching my peers go out there and sing or dance or play the guitar. And I said, well, if I'm going to do a presentation, it better be something that follows the rules of the system, the rules of the society. How am I supposed to be that nice little girl who always gets good grades and who plays the violin or the piano and, you know, you just don't go around playing the electric guitar being that model student, right? So I was sitting in the audience and I was watching my peers put on these marvelous presentations. And my coaches nudged at me and they said, you know, every freshman has to make a presentation. I said, no, that can't be true. My coach said, you better be prepared because once you get out there, you just have to do it because you're a freshman. Now, I was really, really, really worried about that. I actually asked my coach to give me a violin so that I could play a one minute tune in front of them because that's what I thought fit the system, the formality of this cultural convention. See where you can wear formal clothes. But then my friend Ashley went up there and lip synced Beyonce. I was so energized by that presentation that I actually went up there, wrote my name, and danced in front of the whole IAPS team. And it wasn't such a nice dance like ballet or classical ballroom dancing, it was K pop. People were surprised to leave me. But did I feel bad after that presentation? I didn't. In fact, I felt really energized and I felt like I could do anything in the world. This is what happens when you stray from the system. You see, systems and societies will have rules for you. They say, okay, this will help you. These are the rules that you can follow so that you won't get lost in this world of tangled messes. Just if you just follow this yellow brick road that we've laid out for you, you will get to your success in no time. But what defines success? What defines what we want to have in the future? Can that really be considered as what the system tells us to do? According to the guidelines that the system puts out for us, we have to get good grades, we have to get good GPAs, we have to get to good college, we have to get a degree in either medicine or law. We have to get good jobs, we have to get good incomes. I don't think that's necessarily true, you see. Friedrich Nietzsche once said, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. What he undermines is that it almost killed you. The thing is, if you have something that you are really passionate for and you are actually working towards it, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. However, if you don't have that sort of passion and just follow what the system does, what everybody else does, when those things happen, you are going to break down. And I can assure you that, because that's what happens to me too. I was raised to play the violin, and I hated it so much. I didn't get the point of playing the violin. I mean, it was squeaky, it was heavy, it made my body hurt, and I wasn't producing good music either. I just wanted to get out there and play the drums. That was my passion. But then I got in a car accident, and my shoulders still aren't good to this day. And the thing is, if, had I been really passionate about the violin, had I been really passionate about playing the music, I would have given up. I would have done the rehabilitation in the hospital that I told me. I would have kept going. But no, it was hard. And because it was my true passion, I couldn't keep up with it. But then, for example, impromptu. Impromptu is hard. You get a random word or a prompt down there. And you prepare for 60 seconds, and you have to make a speech in front of all these people. And had I not been passionate about it, had I just followed the system and didn't care about any of these extracurricular activities, had I just practiced my math, my logarithms, my sciences, I wouldn't be standing here enjoying this and talking to you about what the system and your own definition of passion and success really means. What do you think about this? Have you not been following the system too much? Have you not been following that yellow brick road that society, the system sets out for you? Have you not been following everyone else like the, just the mob? What are you? What do you feel like? What is your passion? Do what you feel like you want to do, because that's what you're supposed to do. And if you're really passionate about something, that does not kill you, will make you stronger.
I love my dad. I love my dad for a variety of reasons. He's my father. He provides for me. But the reason that I love him the most is because he never ceases to make me smile. Let me give you an example. It was late at night, and me, being hungry, ventured into the kitchen, where I saw my dad. I said, my dad said to me, son, why are you in the kitchen? I said, well, dad, I'm hungry. He said, hi, hungry, I'm Barry. I said, dad, this isn't a joke, I'm serious. He said, I'm serious too. Very serious. <laughs> my dad has the unique ability to turn everything and anything in life into a game. For him, life is essentially about one thing, and that is game on. He is all about fun, about playing, about having a great time. And you know what? I want to be like my dad. I never want to have too serious of a life. I want my life to have the motto, game on. And let me tell you about three instances of people who live their life to that motto. First of all is the famous man, a man whose name resounds in history because of how adequately named he was. His name was Armand Tanny. Now Armand Tanny might not seem like a great name, but he was a bodybuilder, so he was all about arms and tanning. <laughs> what did Armand Tanny do? Well, in Venice, California, there is a beach that is now called Muscle Beach. Because Armand Tanny took his gym, moved it, and put it on the beach. He wanted to get a tan while he lifted weights. <laughs> he was all about fun. He was all about doing what he liked. So he would work out on the beach, chill out at the beach, and eventually move to Hawaii, the ultimate beach. Armand Tanny never really competed. He never really did much with his bodybuilding career. But he's famous because he did what he liked, and that was tanning and lifting weights. Now, another instance of two people who lived their life by the modicum of game on, doing what they loved, were two men in the book by, in the play by Samuel Beckett, Waiting for Gatto. Now, in Waiting for Gatto, there's two main characters, Vladimir and Ashtar. Now, they wait on the side of a road, a very depressing road, for someone to come. And this is two acts of essentially nothing happening. Now, it's as interesting as you would think. But, luckily for us, it's also interest, not that interesting for Vladimir and Eshron, as they have to find games to fill the time. They throw stones. They play with rope. They draw things in the sand. They are about gaming. They are about having fun. They find ways to use up their time. In the amount of time that they are given, they remember to game on just to pass the time. They're all about having fun. But, let's take ourselves back to real life. Let's look at not a bodybuilder, not characters from a book. Let's look at someone who is like you and me. Let's find someone that any of us could become. We live relatively boring lives. We forget the motto, game on. But let me tell you about an average man. A man that was average until he decided game time was on. His name was Bob McLaughlin. And what did Bob McLaughlin do? He built a tank. Bob McLaughlin in his basement took a bulldozer and he hammered onto it three-inch steel plates of any place that it could possibly be damaged. But that's not the great feat that Bob McLaughlin did. He put three-inch steel plates on his heart. Because he got into that tank and he drove it into the lo local bank, local library, and local town center. He did whatever he wanted to with this tank because he could. He was having fun despite the damage that it may have caused. And you know what? I look up to Bob McLaughlin. <laughs> Because this man was all about gaming. He was all about having fun. For him, his life was great. He may have made it worse for other people, but that's beside the point. Bob <laughs> McLaughlin enjoyed himself. And that's what I look up to. So in times of my life, i.e. tournaments like this, things look a little serious. But I want to keep in my mind a simple phrase. A simple phrase to game on. Now, I may not be a bodybuilder. I may not be the central figure of a French play. I may not be a man who will one day build a tank, but I am a student, and I will have fun. Thank you.
A month ago, my sister and I were sitting head to head on a glass table. Sitting on a glass table, we were thinking, why sitting on a glass table? We are head to head over a game of chess. I am the black fortress looking out against the white army in front of me. I look at the wave of white that stands in front of me and I move my horse in a small L position. It is Chinese year, we are head to head. 15 year old Patrice and 18 year old Krista look at each other, lock eyes, and say, Game on. I am five years old and I am in my very first ballet class. I have a lot to prove considering that I look a little different from the other girls. I weigh 10 kilos more, 10 centimeters shorter, and I look around at the sea of little petite girls standing around me. I look at them and I realize that I have something to prove. My ballet instructor looks at me and says, why are you here? I am five years old and I have nothing else to say besides that I love to dance. I love the way the music came in one ear and came out through the way my fingers and my toes spread. I am five years old and I am a little fat. It is a little hard for me to move in this ballet class, to find my way and snake through these thin peoples who skate along the surface. I am five years old and I tell the world, game on. Tell the world, game on. I am ready to dance. I am 12 years old. My dad tells me that Apak had passed away. Apak was 100 years old. She was 100 years old, which means she saw the beginning of the First World War and lived through all of that and came, it, and came out of it in 2010. 1910 to 2010, she lived a life where she had to look the face of the world and say, game on. My father tells me about how she was 12 years old when she smuggled herself on a boat off the coast of Hainan. She sails all the way down to a small island in Indonesia and she lands there. She is 12 years old and she knows nothing about where she is, but she has to look the world in the face and say, game on. She doesn't know how to speak the language. The fruits that she picks off the trees taste weird to her. She doesn't know what it is like to live without winter, but she is here, sweating, sweating, shouting, with no one else to save her, but she says, game on. She has six kids, and one of them is my father. My father is watching the live stream from his little computer today. I am 18 years old and making my final impromptu speech in a crowd of 1,500 people. I see a sea of faces around me. I see them looking at me, and I see them looking at me and challenging me, what do you have to prove? Five foot three, a little pudgier than any other girl that I've ever seen, a little awkward with the way she moves, spitting into the mic a little bit more, what does she have to give to me? What can she bring to the table? Will I challenge you game on? I have always been told since that ballet class, and even through my very own grandma's experience, that I wasn't worth the game. I was a spectator. I was only worth enough to watch and pretend that I cared about what other people wanted me to do. I am 18 years old and my hands are shaking a little. I'm shaking a little because I know that the people watching me are not just the eyes here, but the but the eyes of the people who are watching behind closed glass computer screens. I tell the world, game on. I tell the world to listen to the five-year-old fat girl in the corner of the ballet class who was challenged as to why she wanted to dance because she didn't look the part. I am my 12-year-old great-grandma who lands in a small island in Sumatra knowing anything but where she landed. I am 18 years old and I'm looking out at a crowd of eager faces who want me to say something. But what I am telling you today is that whoever you see up here, whoever you see around you has a game to play. And to that they all say, game on. Thank you.
So I was in the second season sport. And before the game began, it was always eye to eye with the opponents. And they look at me, and I look at them, and we just came on. We were aggressive, we were passionate, and we were there to win. See, when, when, when you consider the phrase, game on, often I like to see it as a good thing. To be aggressive, to really want to win, and to be fighting and hungry for victory is often the mentality that victories have. And to have such a mentality is often very successful is often very good and leads to success. So let's look at some examples where people have had the game on mentality and have succeeded greatly. Let's look at the Korean War. See, near the end of the Korean War, there was a uh, tank platoon leader. His name was David Teak. Army Ranger, very classic military man. And he was on a 38 parallel right between North Korea and South Korea. His campaign had finished. Right as it finished, though, he got a call. It was Mayday, Mayday, we need help. We're being pinned down from one of his fellow army rangers. And what happened was, he said, we have to help, leave no man behind. But then immediately he got a call from superior saying, screw them, let them fight their own battles. Save your lives. But David T. knew victory, a pure victory was not a victory. Even though we won our battles, we must help others. He knew it was game on. He went to go fight something else. And he was hungry for the victory. He was hungry to save his friends. And then David T. called for volunteers, and they took four tanks and charged straight into a team of 30,000 Koreans. In the end, he succeeded. His tanks were bullet riddled, and their tanks were full of people, but he managed to succeed. It was all because of that mentality. If not for a game on mentality, such things would never happen. A platoon would be dead. But let's look at another example. Let's look at ancient China. There was this man by the name of Yen Tzu. He was a short fellow, Napoleon short. Anyways, Yen Tzu was, what, it was, this was during the Warring, Warring States period, and Yen Tzu was tasked to go visit another stronger state. See, during the Warring States, there were a lot of separate states, and there was very little diplomacy. Well, there was a lot of diplomacy, but they had trouble trying to find allies. And this small state in which Yen Tzu hailed from had to go find allies. So they sent him away, and he went to go visit this larger kingdom. As he approached the larger kingdom, though, the king, being a very posh and egotistic king, said, Let him enter through the, the small door in which the, the ox and the slaves and the rats come through. Don't open the big gates. And from then, Yen Zin told himself, Game on. That's what you got. So Yen Zin walked in, a little man, and he met with the king. And the king said, Why would a king, a small man, must be in a small kingdom? Where, why are you here? And Yen Zi succinctly said, my king only sends the weakest ambassadors to the weaker kingdoms, and the best ambassadors to the best kingdoms. Now might I add, that was a royal wrecking in ancient China. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Yen Zi managed to, because of his mentality, because he knew it was game on, and he knew he could not be demeaned by such simple mental tactics. He fought for it, and he made the best out of it. And it was his mentality that brought success not only to his reputation, but also to his kingdom. Ultimately, even to this day, Chinese parents tell their children the story again. It is the idea that you should never give up, never capitulate, and always go into a battle, game on. Let's look at the last example. Airplanes, they're really cool. I like airplanes. And there's a guy by the name of Cliff Junkins. Cliff Junkins, Royal Air Force man. He was never really the fighter pilot. He was always the guy that flew the big planes. This one day, he flew the F-8 Crusader. It was a new plane, newly designed, it was meant to carry people. And it, one day, though, he was flying this new F-8 Crusader. It was soaring something like 20,000, 15,000 feet in the, in the air. And all of a sudden, one engine blows up, the other engine blows up, and he, he knows to screw. He pulls for the, the eject lever, nothing happens. So, being a smart dude, he said, you know what, I'm a fighter pilot. My mentality is always victory. I will not give up. Cliff Judkins then grabbed the parachute, literally opened the door and jumped out. And then again, his parachute failed. Nothing seems to be working for him. Cliff Judkins could have just gave up and just fell to the ground. But he used his training and directed himself to a softer landing place, a pasture, and managed to survive despite many multiple broken bones, shattered organs, and other bad things. The point is, Cliff Judkins' mentality is what kept him alive. He did not say no to death. He said, bring it on, let's fight.
and he broke through. He survived. But the point is, sometimes we must fight and say game on to whatever it is. Thank you. traveling into another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey to a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. There's a signpost up ahead. Your next stop, reality. Because that's pretty much what the Twilight Zone was, right? At the end of every episode, Ross Sterling would come up with his little smirk and pretty much ask the audience in a variety of ways, is it really so strange? Is what you see with all those aliens really so different from our lives? Because life, it has a narrative, it has a system that it always follows. What comes up must go down. And that's why life is, we see art imitating life all the time. What comes up must go down. Life has a narrative. Everything is pretty much the same. I'm kind of a film nerd, and so my goal in life is to produce a film. Not write it, not direct it. I don't have the talent for that type of stuff, but it's to produce a film. So on my computer, I have all these sticky notes of film ideas that I'd like to produce. And one of them it just said Bobby Driscoll. And Bobby Driscoll was the uh, voice actor of The Boy Who Never Grew Up, Peter Pan. Um, but before that, he was also in the movie Song of the South, which is where Zippity Doo Dot come from, which is why the film's going to be called Mr. Bluebird. I had it all planned out, okay? It's going to be called Mr. Bluebird. And before Lindsay Lohan and Britney Spears, he was kind of the first guy who was this famous child actor who wanted to be famous for away from Disney, which was unheard of at the time. You were with Disney, Disney was huge. You weren't gonna give it up, but he wanted to be different. And so he traveled to New York to kind of um, get out of there, and it's really experimental stuff back then. So he's into the pop art movement, which is why it's gonna be a successful film. I mean, you got old Hollywood, you got Disney, you got pop art. It's like all the stuff that makes a good vibe, okay, 
come on. So he's traveling to New York, and he's part of that whole Andy Warhol factory movement, and what happens is it doesn't work out. Because that's always what you see in movies and in life. There's that system in place. What goes up must come down. Things seem great, and then suddenly you turn around, and two years pass, there's no record of him, and he was found and left in an unmarked grave until about several years later when they were trying to make a song at the South Reunion. Um, they were trying to find all the cast members, and that's only when they discovered his body in an unmarked grave. I mean, it's like his story was fit to be a biopic. I'm surprised nobody's done it yet, which is why I'm going to do it. I'm just saying that I'm going to, I'm going to be the one to produce it, Mr. Cooper. Life has a system in place. Things, we love things that are a true story. I was watching this um, comedian, I don't remember who, but he was saying, if you want to get a girl to watch a movie, say, it's based on a true story. Because that's always what gets them. Wolverine, yeah, it's based on a true story. <laughs> You see movies, and you aren't Wolverine, you aren't aliens, but you see them in your own life, kind of the ups and downs of what they do, right? You see all those things because life has that system. Things go up, things go down. You kind of tragedy, comedy, there's this climax, and then there's this falling action and this reversal of fortune. It's the same everywhere we go because of the system that's in place in our lives. Um, beside that little uh, sticky note is words I like. One word is horticulture. I don't know why. I like the sound of it. And there's uh, this woman, Dorothy Parker, is one of the original writers of the New Yorker. She's known for her witticisms and for horticulture. She once said, um, you can lead a horticulture, but you can't make her think. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, beside that sticky note, I have this poem by Dorothy Parker called Theory. It goes, um, into love and out again. Thus I went and thus I go. Spare your voice and hold your pen. Well and bitterly I know. Of all the words ever sung and all the words ever said, could it be when I was young someone dropped me on my head? And I'm pretty sure, I mean, from the age of 12 or like a tiny six or something, six years old to whatever age, you kind of have that, you, you sympathize with that. All the words ever sung, all the words ever said, all these movies and films that have a narrative, you see it in your own life about love, about these delusions of grandeur, about trying to be famous, there's this system in place, and we always know it to be true. We all kind of follow this system. We have our ups, our downs, we believe in love, and then at the last minute, we're in love and out again, and it's ridiculous, because it's the same thing again and again. That's why we love true stories, and that's why we sympathize with characters, because reality is also fiction. In fiction, reality, art imitates life. Life is stranger than fiction. So that's what makes these films and all these books and the Twilight Zone so memorable to us. Thank you.
was sitting at AP Lang the other day, and we were talking about education. We were talking about what makes a good education, what makes a quality education. And we were also talking about how, what the education system should do for the best student. And I heard my teacher say something that appalled me. I mean, she said, the education system, the point of the education system is to create a product. A product. Now, my response to that was, I'm not a product. I'm a student. I'm a person. And in reality, I, would, I recognize the fact that my education, in a lot of ways, has become a system. And I realize as well that I live in systems. My life is just one product on a conveyor belt of absolute agony. And I'm going to explain why. Now, the first thing about my specific education that is a system is APs. Now, I mentioned AP Lang, but all APs, really, they're crammed, and we know that. I've seen people have absolute mental breakdowns, I mean crying, sobbing in the library over not getting a five or not getting a, or not getting a four, and absolute just breaking down. And I, I want to tell them that, listen, this is a system. You are just gonna jump through the hoops and you are going to do the same exact thing that your predecessors, the former students, the graduates did. Because when we do all these uh, let's see, problems, and we do all these different examples, say for free or calculus, we're doing the same problems that somebody did three months ago. Maybe they did it faster than you, maybe they did it in a short amount of time than you, maybe they did it better than you, more neat, but they did the same thing. Education, education excuse me, in a lot of ways, it's just a system. Now, I'm sure a lot of you hate communists, and don't worry, I hate communists as well. <laughs> but remember, remember, that capitalism, which is a system, by the way, is detrimental to the people involved. Capitalism, which is really connecting it to schools, what we're being, what we're being made to go into, what we are being created, our, we're being molded by clay to go into this capitalist society, is really a system because poor people people who are in positions where they don't have enough money cannot get out of it. Now, again, I said I love, I said, oh, excuse me. I said I do not love communism, and I do not love communism. Don't worry, that's a system as well. But unregulated capitalism, which we are in love with in the West, we don't want to do anything, we don't want to eliminate it in any way, is detrimental to the people who are involved in it. There's a system of poverty, because when your child can't get education, because you didn't get enough money, they cannot get up in the world, and therefore they can't get enough money, and the system goes on. We go from a school system, literally called a school system, to a system of poverty and ridiculously outlandish capitalism. Now, the most important system is the system of life. And that sounds absolutely idiotic. And hold on. My point about that is that we live and then we die, right? Our whole life, not just specifically education and work, the whole thing is a system. We go from education, we go to work, we go from education to then we go to college, then we go to work, and then we go and maybe we get dropped off in some elderly folks home, and then we die. And then that's what happens. And you can look at it from that way. And it's a valid way to look at it, because dying sucks, and living in that system really sucks. It's horrible. And remember, there's no way to break away from dying, you're not going to become immoral, but you can choose to do things differently. You can choose to break away from the system, the system that tells you that you cannot be gay. You cannot be bisexual. You have to live in a certain way, a homogenous society made up of males and females, blacks and whites, people of different colors, different races. We need to learn that the system of life, the system of education, the system of work can be broken but it's all up to you. Thank you.